Yeah, I think it's a mistake to kind of have your life where you're waiting for retirement to do like some of the things you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, My brother-in-law recently retired and he told me, he said, you know, he's a vascular surgeon. And he said, I really think you're doing your life right because you are working really hard, but you're also taking nice vacations. You've got a lot of fun hobbies that you enjoy. And most people aren't doing that. And I didn't realize that. I thought everybody does what I do. And um, my wife said to me the other day, yeah, why are you going to wait for retirement? You're just going to wait for like your first round of prostate cancer and, um, you know, chemo. And that's that's going to be your retirement. So what are you waiting for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the people that we, that's our clientele. Yeah. Right. Okay, I'm ready. All right, awesome. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. In this episode, I'm inviting you all to meet with Dr. Frederick Tiesinger. Um, just before we begin, I want to let you all know, um, I worked with Dr. Frederick Tiesinger about a year ago at the hospital. And he has a whole laundry list of accomplishments we're going to get into. And the point of this video is going to be to inspire you all to learn to become an amazing physician and what it takes. And then we're also going to dive into Dr. T. Singer's life and how he became who he is today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Dr. Tiesinger. Mm-hmm. Nice to see everybody out there today. Um, hopefully you'll learn something that's useful to you today and um, eager to tell you what you need to know. Awesome. So before we dive into how students can become a successful surgeon, you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So um, I'm a surgeon in Chicago. I've got a group with six surgeons in it. We do breast surgery, colorectal surgery, robotic surgery, bariatric surgery, um, all types of general surgery. And uh, we work at six different hospitals. And one of my main hospitals is um, West Suburban Hospital, where we do a lot of the, pretty much all the general surgery. And run a very busy practice, tend to run two rooms on Tuesdays and three rooms on Thursdays. And uh, we try to help a lot of people. We try to have fun while we're doing it, do good patient care. Awesome. And busy is absolutely right. Like just before we started this podcast, you had a call and, you know, you had to take care of all this stuff. So I do want to say thank you. I really appreciate that you took the time to come out and speak with all of us. You got it. Awesome. Um, so what does it take to become a surgeon? Like after, imagine, right, like this is kid, he wants to become a surgeon. You know, he's following you on Instagram and he's saying, wow, like, how do I be like this? And he's coming out of high school. What are the steps that he needs to take? Yeah. So coming out of high school, um, I think it's really important to do some things that make people realize that you want to get into medicine or into surgery. So you should spend some time volunteering at a hospital in your area. Uh, Maybe spend some time working at a hospital. Like for me, I worked my summers during college. I worked as a nurse's aide and a transporter and a unit clerk through those summers. And I got to really see how the hospital works. And, you know, I had really kind of no idea what was really going on in a hospital until I got there. I didn't realize like the level of suffering that people are having. You know, I was, you know, when you're that age, you know, you're thinking about, you know, what new shirt you want to get or want to get a dirt bike or lots of other things that really seem unimportant when you see people dealing with real tragedies in their life. And that, that impacted me a lot. And, um, but I think that it's important to get those experiences because when you go to college and then eventually apply to med school, you have to have something on your resume to prove that you're interested in helping people and, and being involved with the, the medical community. How long have you been in practice for? And, you know, uh, would you be able to tell us that? Sure. So um, I got out in 1996 and um, I joined my father in 1996, and then the practice just kind of morphed into what it is today. When I joined, uh, we had, I was the third surgeon, and uh, we went on to grow since then. We got up to, I think, as many as nine surgeons. And so I think it's been 23 or 24 years now that I've been doing this. So it really goes fast. I'm telling you, it goes super fast. And now it's 2021, so. That's almost 25 years. Wow, that's incredibly a long time. 
A long time. Yeah, it's too long. Too long. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and so, so you did residency, and then um, did you do anything after that in order to? Because um, I, I may, I probably haven't mentioned this, but Dr. Tisinga is a general surgeon as well as a weight loss surgeon. Uh, he deals with all kinds of bariatric surgeries. Um, so, how long did it take in order for you to like specialize in that niche? Right. So what happened for me is that, um, first of all, I never really thought I wanted to be a surgeon. I got done with high school and I think I got a bad grade on my final in chemistry. And I told my teacher, I said, you know, um, I don't want to do anything with medicine anyway. I'm going to be a businessman. And I got to college and I really didn't know what to major in. And I decided I'm going to major in pre-med because that's like the hardest one. And you can always go to business from pre-med. It's hard to go from business to pre-med. And I just kind of ended up going down this track and kept going. And I remember getting to my, the end of my second year in med school and thinking, I'm just kind of sick of this. I'm sick of all this memorizing and I'm sick of everything. I called my brother, said, you know, I think I'm just going to quit med school. And he said, well, he said, you probably should just finish it now Mm -hmm. that you're this far into it. And he said to me something interesting that um, Winston Churchill said, he said, you don't have to like it. You just have to do it. And I thought, all right, that makes it, that's kind of freeing to me. I'm just going to do it. And I got done with med school and I ended up in a surgery residency and pretty soon I ended up working with my dad and I really started to like it. And that's why I want to be encouraging to all the pre-med students out there and all the medical students that there's something in medicine for everyone. If you kind of can't stand your rotations, you can, you can, um, turn medicine into whatever kind of fits your personality. You know, you can be in the basement reading x-rays all day. You can be a pathologist. You can do boob jobs all day or inject people with, uh, uh, with fillers. And so mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's something for everyone in medicine. So um, don't lose hope. And so for me, I got to be about um, five years out. And my dad had done a lot of weight loss surgery. Um, and weight loss surgery, you know, 30 years ago was more like a, a one-off kind of thing where people thought that that was like crazy surgeons operating on people. And But weight loss surgery, more recently, the medicine has caught up with the surgery and they realize all the good things about weight loss surgery for your patients. They live longer, they live better, they have less comorbidities, they can tie their shoes without holding their breath. It just It's a life-changing thing. Mm-hmm. And I remember my dad saying, you probably should have like some kind of niche that you do. You can't just be like a general surgeon. So I ended up going back for some extra training and gastric bypass. And this was like 2001. So laparoscopic gastric bypass was just coming um, and becoming commonplace. Like no one had done them laparoscopically. They were open. And it was a revolution for weight loss surgery. So I got trained in that. June of 2002, the lap band got FDA approved in the United States. So I got trained on that. And then we started a, um, we really started from scratch a bariatric center and bariatrics has become um, a very complicated thing where you have to have a lot of um, approvals and you have to have all your results reviewed. And so we became members of the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. Um, I just got done being the president of the Illinois Association of Bariatric Surgeons. Wow, congratulations. And it's really grown it's grown into something um, really exciting. So that's how I got into bariatrics. Wow, there's a lot of stuff to unpack there. So despite you feeling like, hey, I don't know if I want to do this, you still push forward, you know, and and I like how you did that. Like, it's not like I was recently talking about this. It's not always about just being happy all the time. You don't always have to live in this happy, happy, happy world. Like, sure, it's something to aspire to, but not everything is going to be handy dandy all day, you know, like you got to put in some work. And clearly you have and it shows. So I really think that's nice. And then on top of that, um, how you got into bariatrics, that's, you know, that's really cool as well. So tell us a little bit about the procedures that you do. Um, I know, like, obviously I know because I've seen you in action. I say this because I also know you've written some books about this and, you know, we can definitely link those um, in the description below. But tell us a little bit about some of these procedures. Sure. So um, really the number one procedure right now in the United States for weight loss surgery is the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. 
So we do a lot of sleeve gastrectomies. We do gastric bypass. We do loop duodenal switch, and we still do lap bands. And we've kind of built our practice around being able to still do lap bands. We have three nurse practitioners that are here in the office all the time, and we have an x-ray machine so we can do the lap band adjustments. But, you know, and you know, we have a support month, and we have a big website called New Hope Surgical. Um, that's the name of our weight loss center, New Hope Surgical. And you can go on there and find out any recipes and a lot of different things to um, help you continue to lose your weight. We also do the Arbera, which is a balloon that we put into your stomach that helps you lose weight. Um, but I think that that's just the tip of the iceberg. My practice is still like cutting off legs, doing trachs, doing colon resections, mastectomies, fixing her hernias, taking gallbladders out. Um, taking gallbladders out is probably one of my favorite things. And we've done a lot of research with the medical students that are on the service. We probably published uh, 11 papers so far this year, and we're only halfway through the year. So we try to uh, keep it fresh, have fun, learn something, take care of our patients, mm -hmm. etc. No, that's awesome. So you guys literally do it all. And, you know, I myself have seen you in the outpatient setting and inpatient setting. So, you know, I can vouch for that. So I will put uh, the books that you've written uh, about the specific procedures related to, um, you know, bariatrics in, in the description below. Besides that, uh, there's something I want to ask you and it's totally escaping my mind. <laughs> um, but that's okay. Well, I think that you have to also, um, so I've written three books on bariatric surgery, two on the lap band and one on sleeve, but I've also wrote or written a, uh, a very important book about life called I Do Until I Don't, mm -hmm. and that's available on Amazon. Just search my name, Fred Teasinga, and it will come up. And that's a book that every one of the medical students should read, whether they're single or married uh, or in the middle of something else. It's just a good book about life. That's probably my most interesting book. I definitely want to hear a little bit more about it. Like, you know, if you could give us a little synopsis of what we can, you know, expect when we read it. Um, I, and I know you also mentioned uh, searching you up on YouTube or I mean on Google and you'll find like I recently saw this, like you have literally procedure videos of like all different uh, surgeries, which I thought was very cool. So for any medical student that wants to see how surgery is performed, like you, you will find it on YouTube. Just actually search up Dr. Frederick Tisinga. He has his own YouTube channel as well. Um, you'll see all of this in the description. But going back to um, I do until I don't. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you know it came about that you decided to write a whole book on it? Yeah, so um, I think you'll find it interesting. So what happened in my life is I ended up um, going through a divorce that I didn't think I would ever go through about seven years into my marriage. And I ended up having quite a ordeal that went on for four and a half years. And that was right about the time that I was going into bariatric surgery. And I think that some people kind of let their life fall apart when they're going through something like that. And I kind of fueled my life with, with um, the turmoil. And I think it made me a lot better and I think that um, it gave me more time to just work on being a surgeon and developing you know, my skills and, and my interests. I think, you know, woven through the book is, is kind of like my life story, how I grew up, where I went to med school, what my family was like, what my brothers and sisters were like, um, the kind of things I got taught as a kid, um, what, what happened to me ultimately and then what I learned from what happened to me. And there's some good checklists in the book of, of things to do before you get married, things to do if you find yourself going through a divorce, um, things to do to keep your life happy and keep your wife happy and things like that. So I think there's kind of something in it for everyone. Um, and it's available on audiobook. It only takes about an hour and 20 minutes to listen to. It's 70 pages long, it's got pictures. I think the hard copy is best because it's got, got pictures. I like pictures. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Uh, wow. You've literally, you know, you're like steps ahead of the game. And I think that's very awesome that you decided to share that with everybody so that they don't have to deal with some of the struggles that you had to deal with. Um, I like how you said that, you know, you were in turmoil, but you used it as like, like you found good in a bad situation, you know? And um, 
can you tell us a little bit more like how you kind of ended up in that spot and what are some things you took away? Well, I think that um, some of the things I learned is that um, when you're married, if you have you know, too high of expectations for what it's going to be like, then one person's going to be a little dissatisfied. I think in general, people that get married, about 5% of people are blissfully happy their whole life with their marriage. And I think about 40% of people are kind of gutting it out a lot of the time. And then 55% of people get divorced. And so, you know, if you're going to go into it with the wrong expectations, you're kind of destined to be in that 55%. So it's important to be realistic about everything. You know, be realistic about a residency, be realistic about med school. It's not fun. It's not easy, mm-hmm. you know, all the time. You're studying for step one, step two. There's all these things going on. Mm-hmm. And so um, you have to have the right outlook on it. You know, I think that um, some people faced with that situation would just kind of give up or get super resentful. And um, I probably did all of that. But ultimately, I decided that success, you know, become a blazing success instead of going the other way is the ultimate best thing to do. I love that. And so I, I love how you said that. And this is exactly why you're on the show, man. Like spit some facts. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that, you know, it's funny cause my friends and I will sit around the fire on our snowmobile trips sometimes and they'll cheers to my ex-wife for divorcing me. Cause they think that my life has just taken off since she got rid of me. You know, and, and I was feeling very sad about it for many years. And that's what kind of why I wrote the book. They said, you know, you, you should just write the book so that you can be done with it and stop talking about it. So I really won't be talking about it today, but you're asking me about it. So it's your fault. <laughs> now, I don't want to take you back to that time, but I, I find this as inspiration. Like, you know, you use that as fuel to do better, whereas a lot of people would use that as like an excuse to do worse. You know what I mean? Like, oh, right. you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I go, I'm in this situation now. I feel bad now. I can't do this. I can't do that anymore. But you went the other way. You're like, no, I'm going to do even better. Yeah. So very admirable. Um, and, you know, it, it shows. Uh, I'll also link your um, Instagram to to the bio as well, because you, you guys will see for yourself. Like, I'm, I, you know, like, obviously, you care for your patients, you do your work and you know you're excellent at it but you also live a very unique lifestyle like this is kind of stuff like i know other people would want to live out but not everybody does you know what i mean and like that says something like you're obviously doing something differently and that i'm trying to get down to what is it like that keeps you going like what is that what's your like what what motivates you huh. well it's funny that you say that. I think that there's something wrong with me probably because I've got way too much energy. I've got way too many interests. Um, my Instagrams are there's three wheeler itis because I, for some reason I'm super into three wheelers. I've been getting custom built three wheelers built and taking pictures of them. And I'm really into Ford Raptors. So I've got another one called Ford Raptor itis. And then Surgeon Owned is my main my main site, but you know, I've got a lot of interests. I grew up, I wanted to be a professional water skier growing up and I was really good at water skiing. And I was gonna go ski for SeaWorld. And my dad looked at me and said, um, you know, tell me about professional water skiers. And I said, well, dad, they, they got good muscles. They got good tans. They got brand new ski boats parked right next to their trailer home in Florida. He said, exactly. So he said, that's a better hobby than a profession. So I've kept water skiing as a great hobby of mine ever since then. I got super interested in jet skiing for some reason. So I'm really into stand-up jet skiing. I get custom-built jet skis from Arizona. And I fiddle with them and send them back and bring them back again. And my wife kind of just is amused by it, I think. And um, I got really into jacked-up trucks, got really into um, snowmobiles, anything that goes super fast, fast boats. And... um, have a lot of fun doing it. And I think that, you know, when I have time off, I'm just into that a lot, you know, and, and it's fun to have a wife now that is, um, supportive, you know, she's, she's not out buying me jet skis, but 
she's amused by it and thinks it's fine and, and is willing to um, engage in all that sort of thing, which is different from the last one that I had. So guys or women, there's, there's hope to find the right person. Absolutely. And I mean, that's really cool, man. So you're, you're, dry, you're doing the jet skis, you've got um, your, your big Ford trucks. And then on top of that, like I've seen you post some like really cool cars. Do you want to tell us some of, some of the uh, fast cars oh. you're driving? Yeah, so I like fast cars. I've always liked fast cars. I've been buying fast cars since my residency. Probably, um, you shouldn't buy as many cars as I bought. Um, but, you know, I've had pretty much every Porsche there is. Um, GT3 RSs, GT2s, um, Ferrari 458s, um, you know, BMWs, like those old M3s, the the E90 body style or E30. I can't remember which one. There's the one with a cool wing on it. It was I had three of those. I really liked that one like that model for some reason, um, had Corvettes for some reason, Corvettes didn't stick with me too much. I would buy them, keep them for like a month or two and just couldn't get into it. So I would sell them. So I like, um, more like Porsches and Ferraris now. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I've, I've seen some of them. And I'm just like, wow. Like, you know, it's so cool because it's not always just like, Hey, like, you know, I'm just going to go work and I'm gonna take care of patients and I don't, I'm not going to have a life. Like, I love how you keep this balance. Like you're doing, you're making impacts on people's lives. You're doing what a good physician does, but at the same time, you're living out life. And, you know, I think that's really cool how you, how you do that. Yeah. I think it's a mistake to kind of have your life where you're waiting for retirement to do like some of the things you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, My brother-in-law recently retired and he told me, he said, you know, he's a vascular surgeon and he said, I really think you're doing your life right because you are working really hard, but you're also taking nice vacations. You've got a lot of fun hobbies that you enjoy and most people aren't doing that. And I didn't realize that. I thought everybody does what I do. And, um, my wife said to me the other day, yeah, why are you going to wait for retirement? You're just going to wait for like your first round of prostate cancer and, um, you know, chemo and that's, that's going to be your retirement. So what are you waiting for? Absolutely. I thought, yep, you're probably right. For sure. Because, like who like would you rather pull up in your ferrari while you're like 60 or would you rather pull up now like the way you are you know i i see i see it as like you want to be living that life like now like yesterday <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah so so my dad is 92 now and um he obviously has um the wherewithal to do what he wants to do but he really can't do anything anymore you know he's got a walker and he doesn't need to buy a car. He doesn't want a car. And he told me, he said, if there's something that you want to do, do it now while you still can do it. 100% agree. So that's good advice for everybody. Yeah. And then how do you keep this work-life balance? Like, I know you have so much stuff going on. You know, you run a whole bunch of practices and you're doing all of these things, writing books and blah, blah, blah. And then at the same time, you still are able to make time for having a life. How do you do that? Um, well, I think that you have to have some energy. You have to just be willing to do it. You know, people say that if you want something done, ask somebody that's really busy and he'll get it done. If you ask somebody that doesn't have much going on, they'll never be able to get anything done. Cause you know, I have people that help me do stuff and I have assistants and, uh, I got a very nice wife. So I've got a way to, to get a lot done. And I, and I think that, you know, I'm not a boring person to hang around with. I always want to be doing something exciting. So that's how it ends up like that. You know, I've got some of my friends now that have become, I don't know what's happening to them. You know, they want to just plant flowers or um, <laughs> just go out to a long dinner. And uh, that stuff doesn't interest me really. I mean, Maybe it will. Maybe a couple more years it'll happen. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, I, whatever. I mean, it's cool. I, as, if it makes them happy, it makes them happy. But. You know, you, you got you got to do what excites you in life. So that, that's, at least that's how I see it. So, yeah. All right. And then um, I, I'd also like to ask you uh, this one's a little bit more for the medical students. Um, what, what distinguishes like the average student from an excellent student? Like what is an excellent student doing that you're like, this guy is going to he's going to do something in life? Yeah. So I've been talking to my son about this because my son is just getting ready to start his third year and start his rotations in the hospital. And he's a medical student. And I told him, I said, you know, you need to be really respectful, um, really professional, 
willing to do anything that's asked for you, from you. Don't ever like talk back about something. If you get asked to do something ridiculous, just do it. No job's too big, no job's too small. Always be ready for rounds. Be early, you know, don't be late, be early. Um, know your patient inside and out. And I think that, um, and don't take no for an answer. If you're trying to get something done, dazzle your attending with the extra effort you took to try to get something done. You know, a lot of residents these days, they order a test, then they go have coffee and then they go to Grand Rounds and, and they check the computer at 4.30 and then things get done. They go, hmm, shrug their shoulders and go home. But I teach people to order the test, go downstairs, get the test, talk to the radiologist, interpret the results, and then go tell your attending really push it through because you're going to find out <laughs> i'll vouch for that that because that 100 yeah. percent happened and you know what it took me a minute after i realized he is so right like you know in, in any workplace you have people like chilling like all the time you're like you know like they'll be chilling talking to each other like not actually working like very few people actually like w maximize their time and i like how you were very like go downstairs go do this blah 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 because it's like efficiency like you gotta have speed i think that also makes for a very great leader so you know, I, I think I learned a lot of other stuff outside of medicine from you, like behavior wise, you know? Yeah, well, I think that that's the way you need to live your life if you want to get things done. You have to pretend that every patient is your family member and you'd want to get the answer if that was your family member. Wow. That, and that you want to either operate on them or send them home, you know, whatever it's going to be. That's a very powerful way to put it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think that that's the way, I think that the bar is so low right now in medicine that if you come in to your rotation and act interested and sink your teeth into it and start to learn everything about everything, you will be head and shoulders better than any other medical student because most medical students aren't that interested. And I think that um, at the end of the day, um, that's really what it takes to be, you know, then carry that into your residency too. So I don't want to hold you up for too long, but a few last questions I want to ask. Um, one of them being, what is the most difficult surgery that you've performed? Um, and it could be anywise, like emotionally or physically. Um, something that you just like memorable to you. Well, I don't know if I have a most difficult surgery. I mean, you know, like a, like a gastric bypass is you know kind of high stakes a little bit and i remember when i first started doing those you think i just cut this person's stomach off you know i gotta put this all back together it's like a weird spot to be at but you get used to anything i think that you know when you first get out as a surgeon the first couple of years you're thinking about like how you're holding the needle and you know where are all the important structures and after five years of it or something starts to not phase you as much. You might have a certain operation that you need to brush up on before you do it, but you know the principles like that. I can just remember when I first got out having a lot of operations make me very nervous. I was just excited for the day where I had been doing it for long enough that it had become routine. And so I think that, you know, surgery has a way of keeping you humble too, because you can still get into trouble that you haven't seen before or, um, you know, have an issue that it just doesn't work out the way you want it to for the patient. So um, it's an interesting field because of that. You're always going to be learning something. You're always going to be growing. All right. And um, speaking of like, you know, surgical experiences, like I recently made a video where I mentioned you and how you gave me the opportunity to amputate this patient's toes. And that was so memorable for me. It was like, it was a wild experience. I'll link that video as well. But there, I have a lot of stories with you, to be honest. Like, you probably don't even know. It's probably another day for you. But for me, it was like, whoa. Like, I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you'll get used to that. But yeah, I remember having those moments, too. And, and surgery when I first started out. And having the attending let me do things. And it was pretty cool. How, have you, do you watch any medical TV series? No. Okay. All right, because I, 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 I wanted to ask, like, how would you compare yourself to some of these, like, TV shows where, you know, they show all this stuff? Like, I feel like you live a movie life yourself. It, that's probably why you don't watch all these, like, other people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, there might be some similarities, maybe some differences, but um, just want to keep doing my best, you know? Okay, and then last thing, um, what, do you have any final advice for 
the medical students or any healthcare professionals? I think that um, medicine is difficult to be in. I think that we're the most examined profession in the world. And but it also is an honor to be part of it and um, is very rewarding. And so find something in medicine that um, gets you excited. And if it doesn't get you excited, whatever you're doing, figure out a way to make it get you excited. And like I said, when we first started out the meeting, I think that there's a way to make any topic interesting. It'll just make it fit your personality. Absolutely. No, I love how you mentioned that there's a, you can find something, you know, it's very, it's very broad, like just that part, get through medical school. But once you're in, like, you can make something for yourself. And I love how you mentioned that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being on this. Um, I really hope to maybe invite you in the future. And, you know, I thank you. And I, you know, thank you on behalf of the audience as well. Okay, good luck. See you guys later. All right. Take care. Peace. Yeah.